Hi there, and welcome to part four of this series. At the end of part three, we left our 1920s radio enthusiast uh, with quite a problem. He got his crystal set working really well and could easily separate out the stations on the medium wave, but as a consequence they were so faint, they were barely audible in his headphones. So uh, what was he to do? Was there anything that could be done? Oh indeed, yes there was. Uh, the only problem, as is so often the case with such things, it would require spending some money. Um, you know, quite a bit of money actually, um, because what he had open to him was to use a valve. <laughs> Yes, valves were all the rage. Um, they were expensive because they were still being developed very quickly. And um, of course you've already met a valve, I think in part two, this little uh, diode that we used um, in the crystal to replace the crystal in the crystal set. Uh, but that little chap didn't come around till maybe 1940. Um, just let's remind ourselves um, how a diode valve works. Here's a circuit symbol of a diode. It's got uh, just two elements, an anode and a filament, that's why it's a diode. Um, and if we connect uh, a source of electricity, an electric cell, to the filament, it will glow and it will emit electrons. Uh, electrons have a negative charge and they stay around the filament. Um, some of them fall back in, others are emitted, and of course there are trillions and you know, an uncountable number of them. Um, but if we put a battery connected to the anode and make the anode positive, um, it's very interesting because the negatively charged electrons are attracted to the anode and flow up to it through the vacuum, through the space in the valve. And so, and of course they come out and they will go round. The electrons will flow round the circuit, uh, but not in the other direction because, as we have long since learned, a diode will allow a current to flow through it one way but not the other. Yes that's the whole principle of a diode as you remember a current can go through it one way but not the other and uh, we use this little valve to uh, rectify or demodulate the signals uh, back in part two. Um, but an amazing invention was made about 1908 um, of uh, a another sort of valve in the United States in 1908, a chap called Lee de Forest uh, put another element uh, into the diode tube, so it became naturally a triode, and um, this grid consisted of a spire of wire or perhaps a plate with holes in it or a wavy piece of wire, something like that. Um, but if you connect it up as we did with the diode, uh, the filament will light up and electrons will be emitted and they will be attracted to the anode as before. When they pass through the grid, we'll come back to this later, something quite subtle happens, but essentially there is a flow of electrons through the triode uh, exactly the same as they did with the diode. In those diagrams of the triode, uh, there was nothing connected to the grid, but there's something very important we must bear in mind, that when the electrons flow through the grid to the anode, some of them are caught by the grid and they, so the grid develops a very tiny charge as a result and we do have to take that into account later. But we know already that this diode, the diode aspect of the triode will rectify, demodulate our radio signals uh, but thanks to the new grid it can do something uh, really valuable as well. It can amplify the signals. Here's a diagram of the uh, radio wave uh, entering the grid of the triode. And we're going to take this in two stages. Firstly, we're going to demonstrate how the triode valve rectifies or detects our signal. Uh, and soon, in incredibly slow motion, there we go, you can see the waves entering the grid, but only the upper part, which is the positive side, only they can go in. The bottom half of the wave, the negative side, uh, that is suppressed because as we well know by now 
um, current can only flow one direction in a diode, so our signal is detected. Amplification occurs in the following way. Here on the left, the waves are about to enter the grid. A certain amount of current is flowing, uh, this, that, that's the pink arrow, and we've got a little meter in the anode to show how much current is flowing. Now the first cycle begins to enter the grid, and the grid becomes slightly positively charged. Now the anode is positive, and now the grid's positive as well. That uh, increases, it accelerates, it encourages the flow of electrons from the filament to the anode. So the current in the anode has increased. When the first cycle is fully entered the grid, the grid is charged up positive more. Therefore, still more electrons will flow through it to the anode. And you see the anode current has increased. The next stage is that the first cycle has nearly entered, uh, so the charge is less and the current has dropped again. And of course, you've guessed, the, the, the final stage is when the first cycle has completely entered the grid, the current has fallen back to its original level. Here's a very simple animation of what's happening. Amplification is occurring because the signal we're feeding into the grid is really, really small, just what we picked up with our aerial. But we're supplying power from a battery to the triode valve, the current is flowing through it, and that current is either increased or decreased by the tiny signal at the grid, producing a relatively large change in the current flowing through the valve, and that is amplification. Here's a very simple representation of what we're doing. Uh, in goes our radio signal and out comes the signal rectified and much larger. Uh, well, enough of theory. We've had enough, enough of that. Uh, you know, where's our set? Have, have, we, have we assembled it? Does it work? Well, here it is. Our uh, one valve radio. Let's have a closer look. Here's the valve itself. Uh, more about that later. And as we pan out, you'll see we've got some power supplies in the background. Uh, yes, power, uh, supplying power to power the valve. Um, that was another expensive business because uh, the, the valve requires um, two power supplies, um, as you've seen, uh, one for the filament, and that was usually um, a lead acid accumulator, which was relatively expensive, but you could have it recharged. Uh, and then for the... Uh, anode voltage, um, a, a high tension battery which may be uh, 40, 60, 80, 90, up to 120 volts. Um, so uh, radio enthusiasts from the 20s not only had to spend quite a lot of money on a, on a valve but also these uh, the accumulator and batteries as well. So <clears throat> it was a pretty expensive uh, business really. Here comes our aerial. There's the aerial coupling capacitor. There's the tuned circuit. And the output goes into the grid of the valve. These two wires have got 2 volts to drive the filament and this little unit here supplies about 90 volts uh, which goes through the headphones and into the anode of the valve. Well, it's working great. Uh, honestly it is. Um, I'm not kidding you. Uh, you do have to be a little bit careful because the 90 volts uh, which powers the valve does run through the headphones so uh, you don't want to go standing in a, a bucket of salt water connected to earth with and then touch that because uh, 90 volts can still be quite uh, dangerous um, but um, I think you really need a demonstration of it uh, through the amplifier. In order to listen to the output via an uh, amplifier we've put this little gizmo here don't sort of worry about that now but the output goes here to our amplifier if I turn it up there we have the station and it's very selective as it was before and then we go down to the next station Belfast, and I'm very lucky to be joined by a much-loved talent on the Belfast. That's industry, there. The wonderful Anthony Tom. And the third station <laughs> is there. It's, it's very loud. We can actually reduce the gain by decreasing the coupling. Yeah. Oh, God. That big 
So the set's working fine. Uh, there's a little bit of hum there, that's due to unscreened wires, um, a, a, a mere detail, but uh, the principle of the set, it's going uh, great guns. Here's the theoretical diagram of our radio, and on the left, the antenna, uh, the antenna tuning capacitor and the coupling coil, then moving over the tuning coil and variable capacitor, which form our tuned circuit, the output of which goes into the grid of the triode valve, um, and we've got our headphones shown there going up to the 90 volt power supply and the filament goes to the 2 volt power supply. Uh, but what is this other capacitor and this zigzag here um, in between the tuned circuit and the grid? What are they and why are they there? Yes, remember when the current was flowing through the valve without anything connected to the grid, we noted that some electrons uh, were detained by the grid and this caused a little charge to build up on the grid. And the valve won't work very well, um, or if at all, with that charge there, so we have to get rid of it. Here's our grid circuit and we have to make a path for the charge to escape from the grid via this path which we've coloured in red. It will go through this zigzag thing which is a high value resistor and then along there and down through the coil to earth. Uh, and so uh, that charge on the grid will leak away. And that resistor is called a grid leak. Uh, and um, there's only one drawback to it, which is that the fact that the signal that we want, which is our radio signal, which is coloured in green, has got to get into the valve. Now, it wouldn't, be very, it wouldn't go through the resistor, because that's too high. So this capacitor is put there. Um, so that the, this AC frequency can pass through and get into the grid of the valve. So in these little two components we've got uh, the red line shows um, a current flowing in one direction down to earth and the green line shows uh, a current flowing through into the grid of the valve and there's no problem with that. They, can, they don't interfere with each other, at least as far as I know. Uh, they're both quite happy like that and that's how our set works. Well, that's about it for today. Our enthusiast now has a pretty efficient radio with a valve in it and um, he can hear the stations loud. He's had to spend about half a week's wages to do that. But now his wife can rustle the newspaper without him going shh, shh. So domestic harmony prevails. Um, uh, so is that the end of it? Um, well, probably no, because back in the 20s and 30s, uh, the home brewing of radios could be quite competitive. You know, our guy might go to work and say to a friend, you know, my radio is working very well now. And uh, his friend might say to him, oh, you know, well, what, what stations do you get on it? And he says, oh, well, just the three on the medium wave, you know. To which his friend might say, oh, just those three. He said, last night I could hear Radio Paris. So, you know, there's a little bit of needle going on. Our enthusiast might say, oh, well, you know, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to receive Radio Paris? Uh, well, we'll look into that in part five.